Good evening. Good to be back after a month. Baruch Hashem, as you know, I was in Israel three weeks. Every night I had between one and two lectures, marathon. Baruch Hashem, all over Israel. And we also had live broadcast every night. It went between 50 to 100,000 views live. That's how, uh, Baruch Hashem, hungry people in Eretz Israel for Torah. Hopefully one day in the exile it'll also be like that. That when you play a live broadcast, you're gonna get to 100,000 people to watch. No reason why not. We came back from Israel, we had a wonderful Shabbaton in uh, Crown Plaza, Connecticut with Rabbi Zamir Cohen, Rabbi Fanger, Rabbi Pesach Kron, Rabbi Goldwasser, few important and famous rabbis. It was very nice Shabbaton also with hundreds of people. And now we're back to our series. If you remember, this, this is going to be the 16th lecture in this series, The Way of the Righteous, or Chot Sadikim. Last time I spoke here, we spoke about generosity. People, the obligation to give tzedakah, to be generous, to help, to do chesed. This is what the topic was in the last lecture. Now, we're going to continue. And we're going to speak about people that have ein tzara. Narrow eye. In, it doesn't sound right in English. In Hebrew it's called Ayn Tzara, meaning a person has a narrow eye, meaning he cannot stand that other people have things. It's not just jealousy, because jealousy he has, I also want to have. But I have no problem that he has. Let him have. It's not my problem. I don't wish him bad. But the question is why I don't have. That's called, that's the typical je jealousy. How would you look at a case that a person has a hundred million dollars? Very wealthy person. And then he has someone that barely had ten thousand dollars to his name. And the poor guy just closed a nice deal or got himself a car. It doesn't work that much. Maybe five, ten thousand dollars car. This guy drive a million dollar car, but he saw that someone else got himself a car, it bothers him. His wife asked him, what is it your business that he got a car? How can it be? What's going on? Just uh, two weeks ago he didn't have what to eat, now all of a sudden he has a car, but what is your business? It, does, it didn't come from your pocket. And then he begins, you know, one thing leads to another, Lashon Hara. I know it's hard to believe that there are people like that, but there are people like that. As long as they have, they're happy. When they see some other people have, they lose their happiness. Why are you not happy anymore? Because someone else got. I'll give you an example. A woman went to buy a dress for a wedding. All day she spent until she finally got the nice gown. Beautiful, wow, fancy. Now she comes to the wedding, and guess what? Another woman got the same exact dress. She goes crazy. She, she, her smile got wiped out. Her husband said, what happened? Are you okay? How can I be okay? Look at this. She also have the same dress. I thought I'm gonna be special. So the husband asked her, but what is it your problem? There's thousand people here. So there's another woman with the same dress. What's the big deal? She cannot enjoy her dress anymore. Why? Someone else also have. It's very, it's very hard to explain such a phenomena. Why people cannot focus on what they have and it should make them happy with ignoring completely what other people have. It's not, what is it my problem? What is it my business? Let's read some of what he has to say we we'll get more, more an, of an idea what we're talking about here. Ve'ele midot tzara'ayin. Those are the traits of a person that his eyes narrow. Tzara'ayin. One, 
לא ייתן צדקה, he cannot benefit others, because he cannot stand that other people enjoy. He doesn't want to see people enjoying. He can't. So if, he, if I'll give him money, he'll be happy. I don't want it. So he won't give tzedakah. Velo yerachem al anim. Never have mercy on the poor people. Ukshayesh lo masao matanim chavero, medakdeki mo yoter midai. In business, is very annoying. Every little thing he argue. Five dollars, two dollars, this, that. You came back, you came five minutes late. Everything by him is, has to be exact. Velo yvater lo meuma. Even the pennies, they just wrote to him $700,251.21. So the guy didn't give him the 21 cents. He just gave him the big chunk of money. Hey, excuse me, you forgot the 21 cents. Ah, come on. 21 cents? Business is business, my friend. Like in a bank. For one cent, once they called me back. Sir? If you don't want your balance to be one penny, return and give us the extra penny. So are you serious? Say so yes. Business is business. That's the policy. Back with banks, no, said. But between people. Enoma Achil Venom Albish, he doesn't want people to come to his house and eat and enjoy. I definitely won't give his clothes to others, even his old clothes that cannot fit his belly anymore because it keeps growing. So he won't be able to close the belt. He would rather it stays in a closet 10 years than give it to someone else. His wife said, I'll give it to the gardener. Gardener? We pay him enough. Okay, but what are you going to do with that? You don't need it. No, no, I'm going to lose weight. You've been saying it for 10 years. <laughs> Since then you gained a few more inches. <laughs> he, won't, uh, he cannot see that someone else has something. No person can enjoy from him. Everyone hates him, obviously. When he keeps the mitzvot, he always does it in a most cheap way possible way. Tefillin, get me the cheapest. Mezuzot, don't you have cheaper? You can have only the boxes. You don't need the cloth. The box is only $2. The mezuzah is $75. No, no, don't you have cheaper? Yeah, yeah, I have. Here, take this. Only $2. How come? It looks the same. This one has mezuzah inside. This one is empty. They look the same. What do you care? You understand? No, he will never agree to pay to learn with someone. He will never help a friend, even though he's, he's knowing he's going to lose him. When a friend needs help now, he knows I have a rich friend. Maybe he can help me. He won't give him a penny. He's going to say, come on, I'm your friend. I need help. Help me. Lend me money, something. No. Obviously, he doesn't want a friend like him anymore. He, he knows it, and he still won't give. He won't give. What do we see here? We see that it's very obvious that we're talking here about a mental issue. It's not something normal. If there was a poor guy that cannot see that other people have, then we understand that's a natural reaction of jealous people. But over here we are talking that you are the rich one, you have plenty of money, more than you can ever spend, and it bothers you that someone just got a thousand dollars. How can it be? If that's not a mental disease, what else? What else is? So, to get out of something like that, then obviously a person has to learn, first of all, about jealousy, second, about faith, emuna, and how much Hashem doesn't like and appreciate people like that. You should educate yourself always to be happy that someone else gets something, always. Someone bought a house, Labriut, Mazal Tov, I'm very happy for you. You don't have children, and you just heard someone has children. Don't make it take, your, take away your mood. You don't have, you don't have. It's your business with Hashem. It's nothing to do with him. He didn't take your child. His child didn't come on your expense. 
It's not either you or him. What does it have to do with you? Someone else get married and you are single. Be very happy. One guy once told me I cannot go to weddings. I said, why? So I'm, in, I'm in my 40s. He just started his 40s. And I see all these young guys getting married. It bothers me. I said to him, with this kind of attitude, you expect to get married? If, there, if you had a chance to get married, you just blow it. You're not, you may never get married. Unfortunately, I was right. Today he's 60 and he's still not married. What made him not get married? Probably this. Hashem said, you cannot be happy for someone else who get married. You want me to let you get married? It's all measure for measure. We're done with that. That's Baruch Hashem, a very, very short chapter. There's not, mu there's not that much to add. The concept is clear. You have to educate yourself for other people that they get something. I wish you good. I wish you luck. I wish you all the best. I hope you're going to use it right. I hope it's going to bring you other good things. You understand? With this kind of approach, Hashem said, He is generous with His attitude. He's happy for others. Why can't I make him happy? Measure for measure. He is upset when other people have. He cannot stand that other people are happy. Why should I make him happy? That's how it works. Like computer. You press here, you get a white screen. You press here, you get a black screen. It's already known. You just have to choose which button you want to press. Be happy for people. Share with them. Give as much as you can, or sit home and cry that other people succeed. If you hurt anyone, you hurt no one but yourself. And perhaps your children, poor children, that have a father like this. Now, we're going to talk about schira, to remember. Schira of what? To remember what? Schira, memorizing things, it's a trait that the world cannot exist without it. Every business, every negotiation, every conversation, it's all depend on memory. You don't have memory, you're unable to remember the details, you cannot function. A person will never believe anyone without remembering what happened, what he saw, what he didn't see. A person will never lend money to anyone if he wouldn't have a memory. I know one person that has some kind of a problem in his head. He really forgets everything. Everything. So at every little thing he writes in his cell phone. Every little thing. He takes out the phone and he writes it down. He says, well, if I don't write it down, in an hour or two I won't even remember this conversation took place. That's how bad it is. So what do we see over here? I said to myself one time, I hope that his memory won't become worse, that he will forget to take the phone out and remember. <laughs> it takes three seconds. He may, by then he may forget. Now if you give him now money, it takes three seconds from the minute he receives the money until he takes the phone and open it in the right page and write down, Mizrahi gave me such and such, right? Imagine between the time he got the money until he takes the phone, he forgot that he took the phone to write. So he think, why did I take the phone? Oh, I guess I had to call my wife. Then he called his wife and he forget to write. You're laughing? The Gemara asks a question. What's the minimal period of time that a person can forget something? How short it can be? The Gemara answer, Toch Kedei Dibur. While you're speaking about it, as soon as you finish the sentence, you can forget about it already. That's how quick it can be. And I've seen things like this in life. It's a, it's a, it's a, a you lose concentration for a second, or someone call your name. Even for one second you turn, you looked at him, and now you turn back into the table and you don't remember what you were doing. Right or wrong? I can prove it to you. How many times I asked in my lecture, what did I just say? Almost no one knew. It wasn't even 10 seconds. Everyone looks at everyone. Why are you coming to the lecture if anyway you don't remember? 
The good news about the lecture that even if you sit for two hours and you remember nothing, you still get a reward for 120,000 mitzvot that you learn. Ah, you forgot. No, Hashem irachem. What can we do? So, obviously, without it, you cannot function in life. Chaz v'shalom, if a person lost his mind, that's it. His life is worthless. Hashem warned us a few times in the Torah not to forget specific things. If Hashem writes in the Torah, be careful not to forget. Then mean, that means you should never, ever, ever dare to forget such a thing. It's not your grandma ask you something to bring from the grocery store. It's Hashem. Don't dare to forget. What did Hashem say not to forget? Let's see. Yishamer lecha, be careful. Deuteronomy 8, verse 11. Be careful that you will not forget your God. Pen tishkach et Hashem elokecha. Lebil tishmor mitzvotav. That he will make you not keep his mitzvot, his commandments. Umishpatav echukotav. And his ways. This is very big. Someone that always remember Hashem doesn't forget the Torah and the mitzvot. That's what David HaMelech wrote in Tehilim, in Psalms 16, verse 8. One rule by me in my life is, Hashem is in front of me all the time. I don't have one second in my life I don't think about God. That's a very, 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 very high level. Very. Like the highest you can get. Imagine all your life without one second take Hashem away from your mind. One second. Shiviti Hashem l'negdi tamid. Tamid means always. Always means every minute of your life. If you think about Hashem 23 hours a day and not 24 hours a day, that's not always. And Hashem would not write a lie in a Tanakh. Remember, Tehillim, it's Tanakh. It's the divine book of God. If David HaMelech say always, mean always, even when he was asleep. How can you think about Hashem when you sleep? You, can you control your mind when you sleep? The answer is yes. If you purify your mind all your life during the day, and all you think about is Torah and Hashem, at night that's all you're going to think about. If you think all day about women and look at them, that's what you're going to dream about. If you think and talk all the time about business and money, that's what dream, your dream is going to be about. The Gemara say, the mind, the dreams, follows what the eyes and the mind is seeing and thinking all day. Purify your mind, your dreams will become pure prophecies. Your mind will be filthy from horrible things that you hear and talk and see. Your dreams will all be lies and all kinds of nonsense. Why? The mind, don't forget, the computer, what you enter in, that's what the computer has in his memory. You enter good things, good pictures, the computer has good pictures. You enter negative things, that's what you got there. אז חירה היא מעלה עליונה. It's a very important level, memorizing. It's like a tool that holds the entire Torah and mitzvot, like in tzitzit. In mitzvot tzitzit, it says, וזכרתם את כל מצוות השם, ועשיתם אותם. Thanks to the tzitzit. Looking at the tzitzit will remind you about all the mitzvot of Hashem, and... You will do it. Now I want to ask you a question. What's the connection between the strings of the tzitzit to all the mitzvot? How is this supposed to remind me of this? What's the connection? What, what, what was in the mind of Hashem that he was thinking that by me looking at few strings that coming out of my pants, that that's going to remind me the entire Torah and mitzvot? What's the connection? I don't understand. This table reminds me the Torah? No. The chair reminds me the Torah? No. The camera reminds me the Torah and the mitzvot? No. This clock reminds me the Torah? No. What made Hashem think that this object, the strings, this kind of strings will remind me the Torah and the mitzvot? And if I take a towel and tie some strings on it, I don't know, take a rope, 
and tie it to the, like a tail, to the towel. It's going to remind me the Torah and the mitzvot. This wire, it's also a string. It will remind me the Torah and the mitzvot. No. What's the connection? The answer, Rabotai, of course you won't. The question is, will you want it to remind, it to you, to remind you the Torah and the mitzvot or not? In life, many times I want to remember something, so I take a piece of paper and I stick it on the dashboard by the speedometer. What's the connection between this that I want to ask someone to do something? There's no connection. Let's say I don't have a pen to write. So I take a piece of paper and I stick it over here. While I'm sticking it there, I'm thinking, this, I want this to remind me in an hour when I get there to ask that person to say something or to do something. And the minute that I put it there, if I have in my mind, I want this to remind me about that, that's what's going to happen. Because it's in front of my eyes, it will remind me. Or when I want to leave the house, if I have to take with me tefillin or mezuzot, I know I will forget. So what do I do? I take the car key and I put it in a bag. Like this, I cannot live without it. If I, I can't leave the house without a key, right? I need the car key. Where is the car key? Oh, it's in a bag. What's in a bag? The tefillin. Very good. That's a very good trick. Let me explain how it works. Of course, Hashem could have chosen anything. He could have chosen a different mitzvah to remind you, or a different item. It's not because the tzitzit have something special. Now Hashem needed something that will be an item that will always remind us about the mitzvot. And this item has to be on us all the time. Not something that sometimes you see it, and a year later you see it again. It's something that is around you all the time. It could have been a tattoo. He could have said in your bar mitzvah, go to the rabbi, he's going to make you a tattoo where the watch is that will always remind you about the mitzvot. That could have been also something. He could have chosen something else. But he chose this. If he would choose something else, then you would ask, why did Hashem choose this? No matter what he would choose, you would still ask why Hashem chose that. He needed something and that's what he chose, that's it. Not because the tzitzit has a special thing in it to remind us. No. It's because Hashem wanted the person to have something that constantly remind him, hey, Yosef, Torah, mitzvot, Hashem. That's why he made this mitzvah of tzitzit. It's four corners around your body. No matter what direction you look, you see it. And it reminds you. That's it. That's how it is. Now, when a person sees it, when he looks at that, when he prays, what does he say? Ureitem oto, uzchartem. So when you look at the tzitziot, immediately you, you're saying, and you will remember all the mitzvot of the Torah. And you begin to think, this mitzvah, that mitzvah, even some of the mitzvot. That's exactly the point. That constantly, by looking at that, train your brain. That every time you look at that, it will remind you about something. You can do the same thing with people that owe you money. You can have something hanging in your living room. And you, when you hang it, you have in my mind, I'm going to hang this picture here. And the purpose of this picture is someone giving money to someone. Two people, one giving a staff of cash. And I hang it over here. Why I hang it here? Every time I look at this picture, it will make me think, who owe me money? Who owes me money? Every time I look at the picture, oh, who owes me money? Oh, this guy didn't pay. Let's call him. You understand? That's how it goes. So that's a very important way to remember things. What other things you should do? I want you always to remember that you used to be slaves in Egypt. And why did you come out of Egypt? Why didn't you die there? Why didn't you stay slaves forever? Because I took you out. And why did I take you out? Why did I take you out of slavery? Do I owe you anything? How many nations are slaves forever? In China, most of the Chinese people are born and died slaves for one dollar a day, if they're lucky, not even. In Africa. So 
Most people are slaves. In many countries, lots of poor people, slaves. They, just to eat a, a spoon of rice, they walk like slaves all day for one spoon of rice. That's it. We take things for granted. Ah, only $5,000 the watch. Well, I couldn't afford the 10,000 one. I'm so upset. It was a bad month, I couldn't afford. $5,000 you just spent on your watch. This guy in Africa lived 20 years with this. 20 years he eats with that. With this lousy watch that you're gonna put tomorrow in a safe because you're bored of it. That's the way the world is. וזכרת כי עבד היית במצרים, ושמרת ועשית את החוקים האלה. Every day we say three times a day in שמע. אני השם אלוקיכם, אשר הוצאתי אתכם מארץ מצרים, להיות לכם לאלוקים. I am your God that took you out of Egypt. Why did I take you out of Egypt? For what reason? Only for one reason. Not to see you playing rocket ball on a beach or to go shopping in King's Highway. That's not how I took you out of Egypt. I only took you out of Egypt for one main reason, to be your God. And you'll be my children, you'll be my followers, you'll be my servant. That's the only reason I took you out of Egypt. I did not take you out of Egypt to be goyim. I have plenty of goyim in Egypt. I didn't need to take you out to be goyim like them. You could have stayed there and be going with them. Why did I take you out of there? Because I didn't want you to be like them. I didn't want you to end like them. So I separate you from all the nations to be mine. That's what a person has to remember every day. By the way, it's very important to remember that we came out of slavery. Even if today we're free, even if today we're rich, even if today we control the world, even if we invent things, we dominate, we do whatever we have. If we remember that we used to be slaves and every day of our life it's a gift, because Hashem didn't owe us that. He will always remind you to stay humble. If a person forget where he came from, he will become a stuck up show off. You can see also all kinds of uh, basketball stars, or football, or baseball. It's different personalities. One guy became multi-millionaire or billionaire. He totally forgot the days he lived in Harlem there on the streets and didn't have what to eat and was walking hungry all day. And all he had in his life is playing basketball at 2 a.m. over there because there was nothing else to do in life. And the poverty and all that. He already forgot these days. Oh, he's driving a Ferrari. He lives in a $20 million mansion. He doesn't have time. He doesn't have time to stand and speak to poor black kids when they scream his names or to give them autographs. Don't bother me with this nonsense. Why? Because he forgot where he came from. But then you have different kind of players. No matter how successful they are, how rich they are, when they'll see a poor black kid, they will remind them immediately how I used to be. And no matter what, he's going to go and help him out, even giving him a million dollars sometimes. Because he's sick or whatever the case is. Why? Because they cannot go on ignoring this kid because they remember, I used to be this kid. Also among Jews you have people like this. People who used to be very poor and fail and now they succeeded and they totally forgot what they used to be. And then you have people that stay down to earth. In this Shabbaton that I went, in the morning I sat next to one of the richest Jews in the world. They said on the news that he has 15 billion dollars. He was sitting next to me in a shul in Shachrit. And you know when we say Vayvarech David in a tefillah, people put three coins. It's a custom to put two in one. So he took from his bag a bunch of coins and they fell on a rug in a hotel. We play in a hotel in, in Sunday morning. Few of them fell on the floor. So there was a quarter and few pennies. So he bent down on his knees with his talit and filin and he was collecting the pennies. And I say to myself, I wish I can film this. 
that a person that has 15 billion dollars is picking up the pennies from the floor. There's other billionaires, if the quarters or the pennies fell, I wouldn't even bother to bend down to pick it up. What am I, a cleaning lady? And I look for the pennies now in front of the people. But with no embarrassment, he went down on his knees and picked up the pennies. Imagine if I filmed it and I put it on my Facebook page. And some people remember who they used to be. Even they still appreciate a quarter or a penny or whatever it is. Not that he needed the penny. I mean, as a, also a generous person, he gives a lot of donations. Not talking a mentally sick, stingy person that is afraid to lose a penny. Of course, that's not the case. The case is, I, I don't disrespect little things. I remember what I used to be when I was young. Even today, when you see people that made a lot of money, they have a value for the money. Every little thing, they still, if they see one thing costs like this and the other one a little bit less, they will care. Their children don't care. They don't even ask prices. Take the credit card, how much did it cost? I don't know. You didn't ask? No. They don't, what, what do you want from me now with these questions? Why is it? Because they didn't work hard for the money. The father that worked very hard until he became a billionaire still appreciate even $20. He mentally in his mind, he remembered the days that twenty dollars was a lot of money for him. But the kids, they grew up like princes. Everything I wanted, I always had unlimited. I never had to worry where to get it from. Finished. Why do I care how much it cost? Someone is paying for it. You understand what's going on here? So. Let's learn from what the Torah warned. The king of Israel. The king. He has to write the, the Torah on a book and carry it with him and learn in it all his life. Why? That he will never ever become proud over his nation king. Even a king cannot be proud. If I won't get proud, who will? I'm the king of the world. I'm the king of Israel. I rule the world. What do you mean I cannot be proud? You're not allowed to be proud. So definitely ordinary people, what should they be proud of? It says in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, Make sure this Torah is always on your lips, always in front of your eyes, always in your ears, always in your heart, always in your mind. You have to, make, you have to be obsessive. Obs There's only one thing you're allowed to be obsessive with. What is it? With righteousness, with Torah. That's why that you're allowed to be obsessive. Why are you so obsessive about Torah? There's no limit. Everything in life is not good to be obsessive. To be obsessive, it can be a mental disease. You know these people, if you move the shoes a little bit, they put the two shoes in the closet, parallel. Or if the car park a little bit crooked, they go right back into the car to make it straight. So it's a little bit crooked. What's the problem? No, no, let me fix it. No, no, we're in a rush. I can't, I can't. That's a mental disease, right there. But with Torah, I don't understand 100%. I'll do it again, and again, and again, and again. Hey, you're obsessive. I don't understand 100%. That's no problem. The more you learn, the more reward you get, no problem. No one will ever be punished for being obsessive when it comes to Torah and Torah learning and keeping mitzvot. <coughs> However, you have to be careful how you behave to others. You have a wife and you are an obsessive person, you can destroy her mentally. Every little thing, you make a big deal. Why it's like this? Why it's like that? Why didn't you do that? Why are you praying late? Why are you doing this? Why, 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 why? She says, Rabbi, help me. Help! Get me out of this hell. Why? Your husband is very righteous. Righteous? Yes! 
But he's also a murderer, murdering me left and right. I can't live like this. Why? He cannot control his impulsive style. It's also very dangerous. But again, you want to learn, be obsessed with the Torah. Make the Torah everything in your life. That's a very good thing. Okay, we're done with this, Baruch Hashem, with the memori memorizing. Now we're going into forgetfulness. Chapter 20 in this book, Way of the Righteous, is Shichecha, for forgetfulness. Obviously, for forgetfulness was created for a reason. Why did Hashem make such a thing in the world? I was once thinking to myself, how wonderful life would be if you never ever forget anything. You remember all the telephone numbers that people told you all your life. You don't need a phone book. Every book you ever read, you remember. You never forget the key. You never forget to drive all the way to a place and that just found out that you did not bring the key. You have to drive all the way back, get the key and drive again. Or you went all the way to JFK after three hours in traffic and you just found out you took the wrong passport. You forgot the real one. Things that happens to us that we want to jump out of the window. Life would be great without it, no? Imagine your wife gives you a list, you're going to Costco, 500 things. You don't need a list, you don't need to take a pen, crossing. This, oh, I forgot, going into the car, coming back in the store. Life would be fantastic, no? You'll never have dumb kids, because everything they hear in class, everybody remember everything. So everyone gets a hundred, doesn't, shouldn't be a test. No one would ever give a test in class, why? What's the point? Anyway, everyone gets a hundred. Everything they hear, they remember, so they write. It would be a wonderful life, no? But you know, every coin has two sides. That's the good side of the coin. But the coin has another side. If there would not be forgetfulness on the first tragedy of our life, when a person just found out someone he loves died, lo aleno, immediately he begins to scream, to cry, to shake. He falls on the floor or on the bed. He feels like his life is over. So upset, so depressed. Or oh, the Shiduch broke up when you were already sure you married a woman of your life and then she dumped you. Or oh, things like breaks people's heart. Imagine now if there would not be forgetfulness. So from the minute that you found out about the bad news and you begin to cry and to scream and your heart is broken to pieces, this will remain until the day you died. It will never die out. These feelings that you have right now, that you feel your life is over and you don't want to live, I wish I would die, I wish I, I wish I didn't live to see it. This kind of feeling, the reason it goes away after a few days is because Hashem made the world with forgetfulness. So every day you forget another 5% or 3% from your tragedy. And slowly, slowly, you put other things in your mind and in your heart, which pushing away the tragedy and the details of the tragedy. So slowly, slowly, you are able to go back to normal life. At a month later, someone that just a month ago, you saw him in a tragedy, falling on the floor and screaming and crying and fainting. And then you meet him a month later in the street. How are you doing? What's up, buddy? Smiling, happy. You're good, everything okay? Yeah, why not? He already forgot. Ah, he forgot. That's the way Hashem made the world. That's the reason for forgetfulness. But overall, is this a positive thing or a negative thing? Overall, the life would be better with it or without it? What do you think? The answer is, whenever people ask you silly questions like this, the answer are always, if Hashem made it, for sure it's good. Everything Hashem made, that means the world needed it. Even mosquitoes. David Amelech asked questions. Why did you make mosquitoes? Why did you make spiders? Understand? Hashem showed him. 
Why did you make crazy people? When David Amelech was taken to a jail, how did he come out of jail? He pretended he's crazy. Making faces like monkey, hoo hoo hoo, ha ha, you know, jumping on the table. The king said to the minister of the army, don't I have enough crazy people in my own city that you went and brought me a crazy one from Israel? Get him out of here. That's how his life got saved. Or with the spider that you inside the cave, if you're looking for someone, now you have to go into a cave. Remember, there was no flashlights 3,000 years ago. You either have to go with a torch or you, or you just don't see anything. You have to try to look for someone. How do you know if, the, if you should waste time in a cave or not? Spider web. By the entrance, if you see spider webs already, if it's five years, nobody entered the place. Then it's, you're going to see spider webs over there. But if there's none, they rip, that means someone went in. It's like a seal. All kinds of little things that nobody ever thought about. Even if it's once in a blue moon that you need it. But you need it. The world needs it. So, someone that is forgetting, his memory is not so good, must always write everything down. It's an obligation from the Torah. Oh, what a sloppy guy I am. Oh, I keep forgetting. You keep forgetting? If you don't write it down, you're a criminal. People give you money. People borrow money. People promise things. You promise things. And you're not writing it down? People uh, uh, paid you that you have to do something for them and you're not writing it down? You're going to forget. Things that you have to do, it messed up your life. So you must write it down. Today, Baruch Hashem, we have phones and alarm and reminders. The mind of the people is not so strong like it used to be. And Hashem keeps giving us technology to cover for the shortage. Like today. Back in a time, you had rabbis that knew the entire Torah and Nevi'im and Ketuvim and Gemara all by heart. One rabbi went from Iraq to Italy. He arrived to a place in Italy. He found that they don't have Talmud over there. The Babylonian Talmud. You know how thick it is? He sat down and wrote the entire Talmud from memory. Everybody else brought his name. I don't remember what was his name. Like eight, nine hundred years ago. He wrote it all down from his memory. What person write the whole Talmud today from the, from the memory? If he writes one page, it will be a miracle. A whole page. Thousands of pages. Everything with a feather like this. By memory. So they don't have people like this. So what do you have today? Torah, CD. Computer, CD. Put it in the computer. You're looking for something, you put the name. The computer will show you all the books that speaks about it. Back then you didn't need it. You had it all in the head. But today, search engines. Look, the, I want to talk about this mitzvah. Kabed et avichavet imecha. You put it in the computer, 3,000 sources. Everyone who ever spoke about it, that the book is in a CD, it will show you all the places. It just saved you a year of work. Three seconds. A year of work. Imagine you had to go over 10,000 books, one page by one to look, where do they talk about Kabed et Avicha ve'et Imecha? But back in time, they already knew each page where it is, in each book. Right away, everything by mind. Today, people are not like this. Hashem gives us, keeps giving us technology. Keep giving us technology. So what do we see over here? You must write everything down. Next thing, the Torah continues, Yishamer lecha u'shmor nafshecha me'od. Be very careful not to forget. That you never ever forget what your eyes saw in Mount Sinai or in the Exodus of Egypt. So it's usually goes together. Memorizing and forgetfulness really it's the same topic. We're done with this chapter. We, we're now going into chapter 21. That's talking about being quiet, silence. 
שתיקה. עם פרקי אבות, יצא זה, אמר רבי שמעון, כל ימיי גדלתי בין החכמים ולא מצאתי לגוף אלא שתיקה. All my life, רבן שמעון בן גמליאל said it, עם פרקי אבות. I grew up among the biggest rabbis. And what one thing I learned from them, the best thing for a person is to be quiet, not to talk unless you must talking. And also when you talk, talk short to the point. Don't smear it for 500 pages now. Short and to the point. When you teach, short and to the point. And only what's necessary. Things that are not relevant, cut it out. It has to be solid nekiah, not like today. You want to be a dentist? You're going to spend 10 years of your life burning times and money for the three months you need to learn how to be a dentist. If they were honest, they would send you to dental school. When you finish high, uh, high school, 12th grade, you would go three, four months dentist school. And that's it, you'll be a dentist. Then you need another year to work for an experienced dentist. One year, you must only practice next to someone that is at least a few years already a dentist. And within a year, you're gonna be a perfect dentist. Who needs six, seven, eight years and hundreds of thousands of dollars tuitions? Who needs all this? It's all a scam, 100% scam, together between the colleges and the government. And everything else. You want to be a mechanic? You go to school. One year, you learn about all the parts of the car. Brakes, sensors, everything cars have. Each thing you learn. Now when you know everything, you work six months in a garage. You practice. You replace brakes. Next thing this. You get a diploma. Certified mechanic. That's the way the life should have been. But today... You want to be a dentist, you have to learn about the Greek mythology. Maybe you're going to do a root canal better thanks to Antiochus and to Archimedes, you know, or to Hercules. What's the connection between this and the root canal? Maybe Obama will answer. I don't have the answer. Uncle Sam maybe knows. You understand what's going on here? It's not only in America, it's in probably all over the world. I know in Israel it's the same nonsense. In Europe, probably the same. I wonder how is it by the Arabs, if they push to them a lot of nonsense also. I wonder. Okay, anyway, we continue. It has to be short and to the point, and only what's really relevant. Also, when you speak to people, short and to the point. You want to tell a story, people's time is valuable. Just right away, don't talk about not relevant details. I'm telling you from experience, people drive me crazy. This Shabbaton cost me maybe two years of my life. Maybe 500 people needed to talk to me. And each one, instead of doing it in 30 seconds, did it in five minutes. Imagine how much time was wasted. How much not necessary details in a story. He could have told me the story mamash in 30 seconds and you get the exact point. And it's Bozir and he was there and he said this and she said that. It's not, what's the, what's the point? Sometimes I tell people, I try to be polite, what's the question? I understood the background and the introduction to the case. But what's the question? They already forgot the question. They've been talking so much, I forgot. Did I have a question? What question? One guy came to the doctor, said, Doctor, I have a problem. He's forgetting things, this guy. The doctor said to him, what do you have? He said, I have pain everywhere, everywhere in my body I have pain. So the doctor said to him, okay, let's discuss the problem. So he said, what problem? He already forgot why he came to the doctor. You understand? So the idea is short and to the point. Ashtika, King Solomon wrote, Gam evil machrish chacham yechashev. Evil. You know what's evil? A fool. 
A fool that is silent is equal to a wise guy. Why? Because no one knows he's a fool. If 20 people sit in a class, there are many people who are talkative. They talk non-stop. From the conversation, you detect fool number one, fool number two, fool number five. Then there's one guy who sits like this and goes like this, but he doesn't say a word. <laughs> you don't know now. Maybe this guy is a genius professor. Maybe he's a total piece of wood. <laughs> you know, you wonder. You don't know. Why? Because at least he's smart not to talk. If he talks, you know right away stupidity. <laughs> but if he's quiet, you have to give him the benefits of the doubt that he's smart. Right? King Solomon, not me. Gam evil maharish. A silent fool will count like a wise. Why? Did he say anything stupid? No. That's it. You can call him a fool. Amru la chacham. They asked the chacham. What is it that you always quiet, Rabbi? Amar laem. He answered. Adibur nechelak learba chalakim. Talk is divided to four categories. One, first category, it's all damage. Cursing, Lashon Hara, lies. Second category, one side damage, one side positive. Like you praise somebody because you need something from him. Or you place someone next to his enemy and you make the enemy fuming. So actually when you are doing something positive, at the same time you're doing something negative. You understand? Or you tell someone how great he is, what a generous, good-hearted person you are, because in two minutes you're going to need him a ride, to give you a ride. But it's not a lie what you say. He's really a nice, generous guy. Why did you compliment him? Because at the time you compliment him, you are planning how to get something from him. So it's good and bad mix. You're praising Reuven, and at the same time you're making Shimon angry. Because he hates Reuven, you understand? The third category... So, the first category, only damage. Never good. Second, good and bad together. Third category, not a damage and nothing positive. Like stupid conversations. Baseball, Obama, Trump's hair. <laughs> you saw the picture? Damages of the hurricane of Miami. <laughs> They saw Trump's hair all over. <laughs> he has a golf club in Miami, Trump. He has something in Miami, no? What does he have in Miami? <laughs> so, obviously, Hashem is fuming. Houston, Miami, Barbudas, Puerto Rico, Cuba, St. Martin, Bahamas all the places of the naked people and all the places of the voodoo and all the places of the idol worshippings are being attacked. And of course people will be angry. Who told you that? Are you the speaker of God? No. Not at all. And we don't know for sure that that's the case. Logically, based on what the Torah say, Hashem doesn't just enjoy to hit righteous people. If he damage a place or destroy it, he has reasons. What are the typical reasons that makes Hashem destroy places? Prostitutions, naked people, sins between men and women, voodoo, witchcraft, 
Christianity, idol worshiping, calling a human being a god. That's the places that Hashem is fuming from the behaving of the people. Also stealing, also all kinds of other things. There could be a lot of things, but usually when you see a place is being destroyed, is because Hashem is not happy from that place. And it doesn't mean that all the people over there are bad. There could be 20% of the people are good and righteous. But the Torah already said that when the righteous live among the wicked and the Satan got the note, go and take care of this town, the righteous get hurt together with the wicked. Once the Satan got permission to destroy it, no mavdil ben tzadik lerasha, clearly in the Gemara. I still think that Hashem had a lot of mercy on Miami and 80 or 90 percent of the expected damage he took away to the west. It wasn't destroyed like they predicted. They predicted Miami to be totally destroyed. Baruch Hashem, there was floods and damages, yes. But they'll be able in two, three days, once the electric is restored, to move on with their life. I actually have to be there on Sunday. Sunday I have a trip to Miami. Let's see how it's gonna go. The fourth category, it's all positive. Remember, the first one was all negative. Second, positive and negative combined. Third one, no positive and not negative, just nothing. And the fourth one, it's all positive. Who knows what is it? Torah. Only positive. Lectures, Torah, Halacha, Zohar, Gemara. All positive. Nothing negative can come out. Talk as much as you want. Read Tehillim non-stop all your life. Nothing bad can come out of it. So this Chacham, how did he answer the question? They ask him, why are you always quiet? He say, when I learn Torah in Yeshiva, I learn, I talk non-stop. I come out of the Yeshiva, everything I may say, it's either negative, positive and negative together, or none of the above. So in the end, in the end it's all negative. Even positive and negative is bad. Negative only, it's bad. Not positive and not negative is also bad. That's why I only speak Torah. It's only positive, you understand? I calculate very much what I say. I saw this weekend, I realized, you know, this, uh, this the rabbi is Amir Cohen. I realized that he's watching very carefully not to talk. Only when he has to. People ask, he answers, short to the point, that's it. But in between, he doesn't ever start a conversation with anyone. Unless if it's important. That's a personal training of ears. He doesn't just sit and see someone, hey, what's up? How's your sister? She moved to Miami in the end? What is it your business now? And that's it. He's going to say, yeah, she moved to Miami. She bought a jet ski. How does exactly it produ produce anything positive in your life? Besides curiosity and nonsense. And usually, conversations like this very fast develop into a murder of Lashonara. Oh, yeah? She's still with that guy. Wow, this guy is a low life. Oof. They went with me to school. Yeah, right away, the Yetzirah already will push you into the trap. <laughs> Conversation that praise the good deeds and criticize the negative de things. Praising the righteous that people will learn to be like them. Speaking a lot about these big rabbis, this rabbi, that one, in the lectures. What's the point? I always bring stories from Rav Steinman, Rav Kanievsky, Rav Ben Zion, Rav Shaul, Rav Ovadia, all these big chachamim. What's the purpose of it? What does it have to do with the topic now? It's not exactly Torah from Mount Sinai. The answer is people looking for a role model. 
you got to supply them with the right role model. When you give them stories from the life of these great winners, they right away develop a desire internally to be like this great guy, great Rav. So right away he wants, oh, I also want to be like him. How I'm going to be like him? I have to start learning more serious. Here you go. You reach your goal. Why did I tell you that Rav Ovadia didn't waste a minute of his life learning, learning, learning? That you just be jealous with him? No, that you will try to be like him. If you try to be like him, maybe you'll be 10% of him. If you don't try, you'll be nothing. Zero percent. And criticize the wicked. Don't be like these people. Eh, there's no wicked among the nation of Israel. Everyone is a righteous guy or girl. All Jews are righteous, Rabbi. Don't criticize. Yeah, the murderers are righteous. The Mechalele Shabbat are righteous. People that steal other people's money are righteous. People who bow down to idols are righteous. People that marry other nations and betray God are righteous. Not in my book. I'm sorry. Anyone who calls them a righteous is a criminal almost like them. Remember this. Even if he has a beautiful beard. Someone come to a person that steals and rape and murder and Mahalel Shabbat and worship an idol and curse all day and walk naked on the street and do all the things that Hashem hates. And he comes and says, what a great guy. What a wonderful lady. Then you're, you're almost like them. Sometimes you're worse than them, really. Because they don't know that much from their life, but you know a lot because you learn Torah. Calling them righteous, I don't think there's anything makes Hashem more angry. So if he's righteous, who is really wicked? There's no wicked people if this guy is righteous. If a murderer is righteous in their eyes, if Mechalele Shabbat are righteous, if idol worshippers are righteous, or people who make fun of the Torah and rabbis are righteous in their eyes, who exactly is wicked? The Torah uses a word that doesn't exist? What do you think? Make sense to you what I say or no? Or you also sometimes think that everyone is righteous. Leave them alone. They're good. They're all good. Well, we read what the book said. That's all. So the Torah continue. And the Torah says, Leganot et araim. Publish the neg negativity of the wicked people. Criticize it. Speak bad about their actions. You don't have to say names. We're not into eliminating people here. We are not the court. But if you speak about the bad things, the people that do bad, they will know that you're talking about them. And even if other people will know who you're hinting about, what's the problem? As long as they stop doing the same things, that's the, that's the goal. Here is even more extreme than what I say. I take it back. What I just told you, it's incorrect. I will fix it now. You are allowed to actually publish the wicked people. That's what he says here. Not only to speak about their bad deeds and their bad actions. You actually like, criticize them personally. Why? Why? Are we judging them? The answer, you're making sure that people will stay away from them. If, the, if you tell people, this is what he does, and this is what he does, and this is what he say, you, have to, you must stay away from this guy. Then the people are waking up. You're saving the righteous to, of falling in the hand of the wicked. If your son wants to go and play with someone that you heard very bad things about him, that he does. So you cannot let your son go. Now if you don't tell your son that this guy is bad, you find an excuse. I need you to help me, come with me. One time the excuse would work. Second time you find another excuse. How many more excuses are you going to find? In the end he's going to go and play with him. 
But if you tell him, I don't allow you to play with this guy, why? He's a thief. He steals. Not once, not twice. From everyone he sees. Stay away from this guy. It's Michal and Shabbos. I don't want you to be near him. He's cursing. He dressed like an animal. I don't want you near him. Now he understands that this guy is bad. Well, in today's generation, now he's going to want more to be with him, unfortunately. That's the way the world became. When you tell people what not to do, sometimes they rush quickly to do it. What can you do? Everything today lost sense. In few places, the Torah prays silence. When a person has a tragedy, be quiet completely, don't complain. It's very dangerous. Don't complain. The tragedy is a punishment for something. Maybe in this life, maybe in your previous life. Complaining about it, saying it's not fair, I don't deserve it, I don't understand what God is doing to me, it's not justice, all kinds of complaints like that eliminate the productivity of the punishment. I'll explain. Aaron lost two sons, he had four sons. In a second he lost two, Nadav and Aviu. Big tragedy. Chazal said that they were bigger than Moshe and Aaron. They looked down at Moshe and Aaron, their own father and their uncle. They said, when are they going to pass? They will take their place. We will do things better. And they both died. In one second, a fire came and burned them, but not from the outside, from the inside. Their in, the internal utensils got burned, the organs, but not the skin. They look like babies from the outside. Not like when a person has fire, fire burns the body. Then the inside gets burned. It's like two lines of fire, like laser, went into their nostrils and burned them from inside. And both of his sons fell and died. What did Aaron's response was? Vaidom Aaron. He did not make a beep. Nothing. Not one word. Why Hashem? Why are you doing this to me? After all what I've done for you, that's what I deserve. If you're punishing me, you have to punish half of the people here before me. You don't say a word. If you say, you take away from what you gain from this punishment. Because every tragedy is also a gain. You may have lost your son, God forbid, but he take away five millions of your sins. Because that was instead of going to hell for 300 years. But if you complain, you're going to get this and the hell. Both. Why? You don't accept. You challenge the, the, the justice of Hashem. How many people will bring tons of sufferings to themselves in the next world just because of their dirty mouth and mind? They never justified anything. They know better than Hashem. Nothing that happens to them, they deserve it. That's how it goes. And few places also, besides Vaidom Aaron, we saw people that were attacked and abused and they didn't answer back. <laughs> David Amelech gave us few lessons about people cursing him, they didn't answer back. In the synagogue, you cannot say one word besides the prayers. Nothing. How are you? Good to see you. Wow, it's been a while. You okay? You good? How's business? How many kids you have? None of that is a crime. Outside of the synagogue. Speak, ask him whatever you like. Inside the synagogue, don't speak one word besides what it's written in a sidur. Not one word. It's, it's serious. It's halakha. It's not an exaggeration. That's the law. Even when they read in the Torah, they lay between one chapter to another, meaning when they have the Kohen goes up, then you have the Levi, then Israel, then other people. Every time someone else goes up to the Torah, there is a minute or two break. 
They make all kinds of blessings. Even then you're not allowed to speak a word inside the synagogue. People don't know it. That's the halakha. Did you know that? You know, it's not that you're not allowed to speak when they're in the middle of reading the Torah. That's disrespecting Hashem. They're reading Hashem's Torah and you're talking about nonsense. Even when they stop reading and they're calling someone else to come up to the stage, in between that minute or two, you're still not allowed to talk. Bottom line, in a synagogue, you have to work on yourself to make a rule. You will never hear me saying a word besides what's written in a siddur. That's a very, very high level. Also, modesty. When a person is quiet, he's, ma he's down to earth. He's hiding in a corner. He doesn't attract attention. Women, it's not enough just to dress very modest. If, wo if a woman is very noisy, non-stop talking, non-stop noise, whatever she is, all the men's eyes are at her. But if she's quiet and classy, nobody notices her. Because she's dressed very modest, not too much makeup, not a wig for $20,000 that sweep the floor when she walks, no high heels that makes noise, tuck, 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 tuck. Everyone looks around, where is the noise coming from? You understand? Woman, when it comes to modesty, it's not only the clothing. It's the perfume, it's the lipstick, it's the makeup, it's the eye uh, mascara, whatever you call it. It's the, the shoes, the noise of the shoes. It's the conversation, how loud is the voice, how much to talk, walking in front of the man, walking in certain places. There's other things in modesty, not only how to dress, which is obviously the most important thing, but there are other things in modesty. Silence is one of them. The, better, the more quiet you are, the better you are. When you have an opportunity to be in a place with a rabbi or someone who knows Torah, make sure you don't talk. The more you talk, the less Torah people will hear, because you take away from the time. Why you don't talk today? I don't want to disturb the Chacham. Let's hear Torah. We all learn from him. What is it going to help if I talk? What am I going to talk about? Business? About the hurricanes in Miami? What will I talk about? Let the Chacham talk. Tell us, is it Dvar Torah? Is it Gemara? Alakha? Something? <laughs> When you talk, you don't gain knowledge. When you're quiet, you gain knowledge. That's the rule. You're quiet and listen, you gain knowledge. Something goes in, recorded in your brain. When you talk, you're not gaining any new knowledge. That's why when you always meet smart person, try not to talk at all. I always tell my, I have a, I have a team in Israel. Team, large team of people that they take care of all the thousands of people who comes every week. Problems, advice, all kinds of issues. I have one of my assistants, I have four main assistants in Israel that they do 90% of the job, these four people. The rest, there's a lot of other people but they're not doing as much as those four. One of the four likes to talk a lot. So when people come to him, he tells them, I record the conversation, if I need to forward it to the rabbi, like this he can hear exactly what to answer. So he tells them always that he records them. But half of the conversation he talks. Every day I give him a lecture. How many times I told you, you don't say more than one or two sentences in the whole conversation. You don't talk. You don't give examples. No one is interested to hear you. We want to hear what the problem of the person is. You tell him in the beginning, I, I'm recording the conversation in case I need to forward it to the rabbi. Go ahead. That's it. Now let them talk and talk and talk. We get the point. Thank you very much. I'll take care of it. Goodbye. You have to ask a question. You ask briefly. Sometimes he talks more than the people. But Baruch Hashem, now he gets the point. He's cutting more and more. The conversations are more productive. 
He does not let the people talk. Now Baruch Hashem is learning. So the idea is to let people talk. That's how much you get information from them. When you talk, we're losing valuable time. That's most people like that. They like to talk a lot. The idea is to be quiet and let the other person talk. Sometimes in Shiduchim, a guy is going with a girl out, two hours meeting, <laughs> one hour and 59 minutes he talked. The girl comes, Rabbi, I don't understand. 60 seconds all together I did not speak. Sometimes it's the other way around. Until the person gets stuck, he doesn't know what to say anymore. Maybe you say also something. <laughs> The idea is, Rabotai, you have to control your desire and your will that you want to talk too much. You have to control it. The less, the better. In yeshiva, Torah has no limit. You know the say of Chachamim, that when a person comes to the world, Hashem already gave him X amount of words that he can exceed in his life. But it doesn't... Uh, apply on words of Torah. Words of Torah, there's no limit. But secular, regular, everyday words, there's a limit to how much you can talk. Once you reach that limit, you die. Sometimes people die younger. If they talk less, they can live to 90. But they use the amount of words, now they're 75. Adios. Why Hashem? I was healthy. Why 75? You didn't have any words left in your bank. Scary. Sounds like a joke, but it's really scary. Sometimes, sometimes, a person listen to a person abusing him, cursing him, insulting him, and he doesn't answer. Is it good or bad? Very good. First of all, it counts like the world is standing on your shoulder. Second, Hashem will help you much more than He would help you if you, if you protect yourself. But there's one more reason why it's good to be quiet. When you answer back to a person that is angry at you and is insulting you, his reaction will be now even worse. So you're going to hear more abuse. If you don't answer, the abuse will finish in two minutes. If you answer, it's already four minutes. You answer again, it's eight minutes. You answer again, it's an hour. It just won't stop. So you better say to him, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry, even though he's totally wrong. You're right, you're right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it won't happen again, you're right. Then he cool off and he leaves you alone. You don't resist. If you answer back, who do you think you are? You're telling me what you're doing, anything better? Oh, uh, now you got him even more. His ego woke up. You know these people that it just never end with them? Just never end. They will explain themselves 50 times. Okay, enough, I got it. I got it. No, no, you didn't get it. You listened to me. I didn't finish. In Israel, sometimes people... Uh, they begin to ask a question. After the second word, the speaker already knows what they're about to ask. He knows the timing of the question. He knows what trigger it. As soon as he heard the first two words, he already knows the question. He heard it 50 times already, 500 times. Okay, I got the question. Some people very rarely get quiet immediately and let the speaker answer. Most people continue to ask the question another five minutes. Okay, I got it. I got the question. Continue to talk. Why? You're not going to shush me. I'll say the question until the last word. Why? Everyone would lose now three minutes. Valuable time. He has to sit and listen to you. And you already know what you're about to ask. Ego. What's the reason for it? Ego. He needs attention. You're not going to cut me short. Who do you think you are? That's what it is. Humble person, immediately. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. You know the, the question? Go ahead. But 
a macho man. No, you listen to me. You know these people, they never let you say a word. Try, every time you try to uh, cut you right away. Ay, ay, ay. So, for that it's good to be quiet. Life and death is depending on the tongue. Hazal says, what a person can, can arm with his tongue and lips is more than a sword. He can make a bigger damage than with a sword. That's why Hashem created to the human being two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and only one mouth. Why not two mouths? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai asked Hashem, Hashem, why don't we have two mouths? Why did Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wanted two mouths? You may think that if a person is alone, he has who to talk to. <laughs> two mouths. How are you, mouth number one? Uh, very nice, mouth number two. How is your day? Same thing like your day, you fool. <laughs> We're in the same place, no? Same body. Nah, that's not what Rabbi Shiva Bar Yochai wanted two mouths. Why did he want two mouths? One for everyday business and one for only Torah and prayers. Very logical. Mouth for secular things and mouth for holiness. Don't mix the same holy place, the, the tongue and the, and the lips that's speaking words of Torah and two minutes later he speaks about nonsense, sport, about Lebron. Rabbi Shimon and Lebron. Within a minute difference. If you make your holy lips filthy. Speaking about, not to talk about curses and not modest things. No. What did Hashem answer him? A person cannot control one mouth. You want him to have two? So the mouth only one. Shtika yafa lechachamim. Wise people are quiet. Needless to say, stupid people must be quiet. If wise that has a lot to say, they are quiet, fools should be more quiet. Right? Shomer pivul shono, shomer mitzarot nafsho. Someone who guard his mouth and his tongue immediately save himself from trouble and problems. In a book of Job 13 verse 5 it say I wish you will be silent and it will be a wisdom to you. Why? When you're silent you don't speak nonsense. When you silence, you listen. When you listen, you gain knowledge. When you gain a lot of knowledge, because you're quiet, you become wise. So no matter how you look at it, no matter how you look at it, always good to be quiet. But sometimes you're not allowed to be quiet. Not good to be quiet. When? When is mitzvah to talk and to talk hard? Not allowed to be quiet now. Don't be humble now. Now it's not the time. When? The answer, I'll read it to you. Lifamim shashtika ra'a. Sometimes it's bad to be quiet. Kedichtiv. It's written in Proverbs 26 verse 5. Ane kesil keivalto. Peni echacham be'enav. When you have an ignorant person in Torah, never learn anything from his life, this fool, like most people out there. And he criticizes the rabbi or the speaker in a speech, whether it's on Facebook or in YouTube or in a phone conversation or face to face. Don't be quiet, because if you be quiet, he will get the impression that you agree with him. And he will think, what a smart guy I am. Even this religious guy agree with me against the rabbi. See? 
No, no, no. You attack him full force and prove him wrong and show him that he's nothing but a total fool. You don't let him think I'm smart, I have what to say and people agree with me. No, no, no. I'm reading it to you. Don't say it's my opinion. I'm reading it to you. אם רואה שהכסילים מלגלגים על דברי חכמים, if you see these ignorant fools making fun at the words of the rabbis, יענה להשיבם מטעותם, answer to correct their mistake, שלא יהיו חכמים בעיניהם, otherwise they will become wise in their own eyes and continue to attack the rabbis. Because they think, look, I have the stage and people buy what I say. If a man over a man, he will be in his hand and he will be in his hand. If you see someone, a Jew making a scene, protest. Don't be quiet now. Excuse me, sir, it's not allowed to do what you do. It's written in the Torah that someone that does it has a death penalty. Please watch your soul, watch your life, chaval. Yesterday I had a, a talk with a husband and his wife already higher level. And she said that he doesn't let her cover the head, he doesn't let her do this, that, all kinds of things. I asked her, is he Shomer Shabbat? Yes, but he's doing it for me. If he was single, he wouldn't do. Everything he does is for me, but he has already a limit. He doesn't let me go from here on. I say, is he here? Yes, he's here. Where is he? Right there. Call him. Believe me, I was very busy. Last thing I wanted is to start a debate with this guy now. But obligation, it's obligation. I gave him a 10-minute speech or maybe 15-minute speech. The guy was speechless. Like this, shock, shock of his life. Five minutes later, they say, Mincha. He came to pray Mincha. The whole Shabbat, he didn't pray at all. I didn't see him in the shul. All of a sudden, he pray Mincha. One strong conversation, right away, can fix the life of a person. He was shaken up. Many of us could have saved a lot of people. How many times I say to people, order CDs and give them to secular people or to people who need a push. The CD is about Shlom Bayit. Conversations about how to become better husband, better wife, better parents. How to treat the youth with these problems today. Alcohol, gambling, drugs, Shabbat, all kinds of things. Almost nobody cares. It's crazy what's happening here. Wealthy people that can press few buttons and order thousands of CDs and give them all over out. They don't even care about And it's been proven to save souls, many, many souls. Why? Nobody cares, almost nobody cares. And now with the USB. USB, 1,000 hours. We made a new one, by the way. We have USB number two in English. It's up to date, up to three weeks ago. Uh, the other ones finished about seven, eight months ago. This one has all the lectures up to now. 1,000 hours. You take five of them for 100 bucks. For sure, five people you give it to, all of them, you will see a tremendous change in their behaving. You know what it is? Person stuck, stick it in his car and begin to listen to lecture non-stop. Every time he starts the car, he continues where it stops. Non-stop learning, non-stop, non-stop. What do you think is going to happen to this guy? It's going to change completely in a month or two. You won't recognize him. You could save thousands of people, you yourself with your own money. But people are cold and ignorant and they don't care. And I don't know what to call it. I, re I really don't know. I don't have an expression for this phenomena. That even their own brothers and sisters and parents, they don't care about. They don't care. Uh, I really, I mean, it's sadly shock shocking 
and I spoke about it at least 20, 30 times over the last year or so. It makes a little difference. Now you heard me speaking it, tomorrow people would listen to this lecture online. Five, six people will order CDs and USBs and that will be just it, that's it. And how many people listen? Tens of thousands. And how many will order CDs? Five, six people. That's the ratio. If this is not a tragedy, what is? That nobody even cares about his own brothers and sisters and neighbors. Hashem is crying for all his lost children and people who already became religious are selfish. What do I care about others? I'm Shomer Shabbat already. I enjoy the rabbi's lecture. Share with others on Facebook. I see, I, I, we post sometimes on Facebook. 50,000 people, 50,000 views, 64 shares. 50,000 people heard, only 60 shares. Such selfish people, 49,940 people are selfish, egoistic. They don't care about anybody else besides their stomach. Show me a different answer to this. What do they care to share? I don't understand. Such, such strong words to wake up people. Elul now, judgment day, nine days. So many lost Jews. Why did it bother you to click here, share, that it will go to 300 members of your page? Maybe another seven, eight will become Shomre Shabbat or put filin or maybe do something better in their life and it will go to your account. They don't know that they lose. They lose the most. People that don't share Divrei Torah on Facebook, besides the fact that they are big criminals, no other words to describe them, besides the fact that they don't share with others and try to save other people when it doesn't cost them a penny, they will kill themselves when they die and Hashem will show them how many people you could have saved by sharing over the 20 years that you were on your Facebook page and you were there anyway and you didn't share or you did not send videos to people in your WhatsApp group. Let's see what would have happened if you did. And then you see 300 souls you could have saved in 20 years. And every mitzvah they would do go to your account for eternity and their children and now you don't have it. Do you guess how you're going to kill yourself? Even if you kept all the mitzvot, you're going to kill yourself for this. You're going to say, I, wow, what a fool I am. By pressing one time, share, second it takes. One person told me, Rabbi, I don't want to disturb the people on my page. Not all of them love Divrei Torah. What's the answer to this? Disturb them anyway. They don't like, they can go. What do you need them for? What do you need them for? If they hate Hashem, if they hate Torah, why do you need friends like this on your page? Why? Why would you want friends like this to begin with? If they tell you, don't send me the Torah, answer, it's my obligation to save your soul. You don't like me, don't be my friend. Goodbye. Insist. Don't be afraid of him. Why are you afraid of him? Worse comes to us, he'll cut you out. Anyway, all the friends in Facebook is all fake. Not, you don't have one real friend over there. You don't believe me? Write in the page that you're stuck in Zimbabwe. And you need help. Let's see from the 500 people in your page, how many of them will call there to help you. If five of them will do, I'll be very surprised. I told it to one boy one time. I went to help him out and I said to him, it's the last time I'm helping you. Next time, no one will help you. So, oh yeah, I have 500 people on my Facebook page. I said, well, the next time you get into trouble, I will prove to you that now one of your friends will help you out. And the next time he got into trouble, three days he was in jail, nobody helped him. Nobody, nobody cared to raise $1,000 to release him from jail, on bail. 500 friends. Not one of them said, guys, we are 500 people, let's give $2 each of us and save our friends from jail. Nobody cared, Bichlal. No one. And then he called a few people from there. They made him excuses. Until who did he call again? 
Was I right? Unfortunately, yes. You understand? It's all fake. All these friends is fake anyway. And if you really have some brothers and cousins, real people that care about you, if they hate you for sending them words of Torah, I wouldn't want to speak with them a minute after that. Who wants friends like this? Who wants to waste time on such losers? Who? I don't know. I mean, for me, it's black and white. There's no in-between. Person hates Hashem. Person doesn't want to hear two or three minutes words of Torah. It's all short clips. Or an article about the life or the purpose of life. Or about proof that the Torah is from God. Or about how ungrateful we are in every minute of our life. Or about the punishments that we're facing if we're not going to change. Or things like that. If he doesn't like a specific speaker, okay, send him someone else. You don't have to insist on that particular one. Which one you do like, I'll send you that one, fine. Or don't listen, okay, I send it to you. You don't like that particular speaker. Well, delete it. When I send someone you like, listen. So what is the excuse? I don't understand. What excuse people have not to share? What excuse? To press one button for free, it doesn't cost you anything, and it will go to all your people in your page, and maybe another two, three, or five will become one day Shomrei Shabbat, and it's going to be your schut, that you save their souls. Give me one reason why not to, besides stupidity and laziness and the heart of a stone. What are the reasons? So, when you see a person is going in the wrong direction, you have to protest. You rebuke him with respect, but rebuke him strongly. We almost finished, we have four minutes left, and we're going to finish this chapter, Baruch Hashem. Seven things were said about Golem. Golem, if you remember my series, Pirkei Avot, that I made a few years ago, I told you that according to the Rambam, there are five levels of people. You have Bur, you have Amaretz, you have Golem, Tzadik, and Hasid. Bur has no Torah and no Derech Eretz. Amaretz has Derech Eretz, but there's no Torah. Golem has a lot of Derech Eretz and a lot of Torah, but it's not perfect. Tzadik has Torah perfect Torah and not perfect manners or the other way around and Chassid is perfect in everything manners, Derech Eretz and Torah those are the five levels of people most of the people in today's generation are Bur they have no Torah and no manners every once in a while you find a secular guy that is very nice and he has nice manners is decent and honest and give respect and help and he has mercy, but he doesn't know any Torah, poor guy. So that's called Amaharetz. <laughs> Some people, they should pray to be Amaharetzot based on that. Because even that they're not. Golem! If you say to someone in Israel, he's such a golem. It's the last time you ever hear from him. He's done with you. Because people think golem is such a bad word. Golem, I wish everyone would be golem in this world. Golem means you have tons of Torah and great personality, great manners and their heritage, but it's not perfect. No, sad, he needs 5% improvement to be perfect. No, who can say that he's in this level? This is Golem. Seven things were said about Golem. And seven about the Chacham. Chacham, Eno medaber bifne mi shegadol mimeno bachokma o baminyan. Chacham, when he sits in a room and there is a bigger Chacham than him, he never dare to talk. You rabbi, you come in a room, up, who is there? Rav Chaim Kanievsky. You don't talk. Say something, rabbi. There is a bigger rabbi here, he's going to say. He's going to answer. Unless the big rabbi gives you permission, it's okay, you can talk to him. Okay, that's, that's his order. Someone is bigger than me, I don't talk. That's rule number one by wise people. Or is older than you. You both Chachamim, you both know Torah more or less the same. But he's 70 and you 40. 
Let the old one speak. He has life experience. You never break into people's world. You never panic when people attack with all kinds of questions. You talk to the target, to the point. You answer exactly what you were asked. You don't go around. You answer in the right order. You ask you three questions, you answer first, second, third. What you don't know, you say, I never heard. Show me, I never read it, I never saw it. After you show it to me, I'll be able to answer you. I never heard of it, I'm sorry. Don't be embarrassed to admit. And always admit what's true is true. Even if he wins the argument. Even if somebody that is nothing compared to you, he just brought you a proof, admit. Even if you look like a fool compared to him now, in front of everyone, don't twist the truth, don't manipulate, don't be a liar, don't be a politician. Everything that I just said here is the opposite by a golem. Someone that is not in the right level, he makes the order, he breaks into people's word. When he's a bigger guy next to him, he insists to talk first. You understand? Even when you're a speaker and they invite you to an event with another one or two other speakers, you have to see who the other speakers are. Better always you tell them, ask the other speakers when they want to speak, first, second, third, and then whatever they like, give it to them and I'll speak the other one. If they want to be the second, I'll be the third. If they want to be the first, I'll be the second. They want us to be in the end, I'll be the first. Give them the first priority. If two people want the same, if he's older than you, let him win. He's greater than you, let him win. You equal, also let him win. You understand? That's called wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> Baruch Hashem, we're done with the shtika. Next week, we are going now, Baruch Hashem, with perfect timing. Next week we're going to speak about life of lies versus life of truth, which is the next chapter. And then the following week, I estimate of course, we'll speak about Lashon Ara and Gossip. And then right between Rosh, right between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to speak about tshuva, repentance. And then Bezrat Hashem, we have now three more weeks in a row that we have lectures, and then we have Chol HaMoed Sukkot. Chol HaMoed Sukkot, we won't have a lecture. But next week we're going to have a lecture. In the following week, it's Aseret Yemet Tshuva, we'll have a lecture. And between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, we will have a lecture. So we have three weeks in a row that coming. Then the fourth week, we're going to have a week off, and then we're back to finish this series. What's going to be after the series? Let's hope I'm going to have the strength to continue to give lectures, because right now I'm very weak. I don't have the strength anymore. I drain myself too much. I'm forcing myself to finish this series, to be honest with you. I don't want to leave something in the middle that we didn't finish it. I estimate about five, four to six more lectures to finish this series. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it will be faster, maybe not. We'll try to finish it, Bezrat Hashem. I also do it in Hebrew, as you know. I'm finishing here, I go, I give another lecture now in Hebrew, in Queens Boulevard. We must finish this series. This series is a guideline for everyone who wants to be righteous. It's impossible to be righteous without following what this book says. Impossible. You cannot be a tzaddik if you do the opposite of what this book says. That's why this series is very important. This is a way to test yourself. You listen to this topic. Am I like that? No. I'm not righteous. Finished. Next. You finish this. You fix. You go to the next one. You're listening about pride. Is he talking about me? Of course. I do everything wrong. I'm not righteous. Let me fix it. Even if you fix a little bit of each, you fix the ego issues, you fix uh, generosity issues, modesty issues, Lashonara issues, you know, generosity. 
even if you fix 50% of each, you are more righteous than before. Still not a perfect righteous person, but you definitely become more righteous. Who doesn't want to be more righteous? What person that learns to and keep mitzvot want to stay wicked? Do you know anyone like that? All the wicked people, I promise you one thing, they want to be righteous. But they don't want to sweat. They don't want to work out to be righteous. As results of that, many of them will die wicked because they don't want to challenge their desires, the obstacles on the way to the mission, to the target. They don't want to work out. And they forget that the Torah says, Adam la'amal yulad. And if you're not going to fix your character and your traits, you will fail big time in the end of your life. You will fail every year in Rosh Hashanah because Averot ben Adam lechavero en yom ha-kippurim mechaper. You will have a lot of pending cases against you with punishments and losses. And the end of your life, when you leave the world after 80 or 90 years, Hashem will review and conclude your life with a big fail. And you will say, I don't understand. I kept Shabbat, I learned Torah, I listened to CDs, I gave tzedakah, I worked with kippah and tzitzit, my wife was modest, the kids were in yeshivot, I ate kosher, I try not to speak Lashon Hara. Yes, of course, I'm not perfect, but I was religious. And Hashem say, apparently you were not. What do you mean, Hashem? If I wasn't religious, who was religious? Look at my beard. Look at my hat. Look at the uh, glad kosher food. I paid double to get the most kosher food that exists. Hashem say, yeah, and I'm going to give you a reward for it. Nothing is for free. You're going to get rewarded for it. But overall, in your test in life, you fail. Why? You're still the same proud person you came to the world. Same exact thing. You're still the same jealous person. You're still the same stingy person. You're still the same angry person. You're still the same person with doubts and no faith and no, no belief and no nothing. No confidence in me. You're still the same selfish person. You're still cold as ice. You're, st you're still everything that you came to the world with. That's how you're living the world. Everything you did, it was like a robot. It never penetrated to your heart. A real religious person cannot listen to Torah on his Facebook page. A real religious person doesn't want to have Facebook to begin with. What does he need it for? You have so many other channels of Torah that are clean and kosher, books, yeah, Torah anytime. They don't even give you access to YouTube because of the commercials and advertisement. There's nothing can go wrong there. You can only go to speaker and listen to Torah. You understand? So why would you want to go to Facebook when people put pictures and all kinds of things? Uh, why, if you're really religious, what do you need it for? Better not to be there. If you're already there, everything we said before, it's only if you're already there. Not to open a page for that, no. Since you're already there, and that's where you learn Torah, you must at least share. You put yourself inside Facebook. Now you have an opportunity to share with others that can hear Torah. That they don't listen to Torah. If you don't share, how can you say, I'm a lover of Hashem? How? I promise you, Hashem will show you that you're not only you're not His lover, you His hater. Because if you love me, you would bring back my children to me. You wouldn't ignore them. You see that all my lost children I'm dying for them to come back to me. Mi iten vayaze levavam lira oti kol hayamim, Hashem says. Ma? Ki ma Hashem elokecha shoel mi imach? What am I asking from you? Ki im lira et Hashem. Lo bashamaimi. The Torah is not in the, uh, above the sky and it's not under the ground and it's not across the ocean. It's very close to you. It's a piece of cake. Jump into the water. I'll help you. There's many, many verses like this. So Hashem is anxious for his children to return to him, to begin to listen, to change, that he should give them the life of eternity, he promised in the Torah. And he's very upset when they don't care and they're ungrateful and they're ignorant and they don't learn and they're wicked. Of course, Hashem is very upset. It's Sahara Shechina, it's called. He has sorrow and pain for his children. 
And if you could have prevented by donating money to CDs or USBs or by sharing on Facebook and you did not do it, you did not do anything to spare the pain of Hashem about his children. You didn't do it when you could have done it easily. And you did not do it. You will never be able to claim that you are a lover of Hashem. Never ever. Don't say I did not warn you about this. And it's clear to me more than I know that I'm sitting here in Queens on a Monday night. That's how clear it is to me. You understand? If people don't, do not donate now nine days before the judgment day and 19 days before Yom Kippur, the month of Elul, now our eternity is depending on what we're going to do in the next two weeks. How does a person save himself? With tzedakah, with charity. But charity to the right places. To save souls. To support Torah. To teach Torah. Not to nonsense. If not now, when then? Now we find it now, now before the trial begins. You want to come to Rosh Hashanah and say, Hashem, I just gave thousands of dollars now. I made 100,000 this year, I just gave 5,000 in the month of Elul to save your children. Immediately the Satan is shocked. Cannot make his case against you. Everything is says, be quiet. What are you talking, who are you talking against? You're talking against a guy that just gave 20 or 30 days of his life for this year to save my children. You want him to go to Gehenom? You want him to die? You want him to get cancer? What do you want? This is how I'm going to pay him back for giving thousands of dollars in a month of Elul to save other children, running in the street and giving CDs, sponsoring CDs, giving USBs to every one of the people in his work that they can become Shomrei Shabbat. This is the one that you want me to attack? Hashem oh, cannot touch you. It's a great insurance policy. I hope people will be smart to do it before it's too late. After Yom Kippur, you can still do it. But it's not going to be anywhere as productive as now. Now it's the time. Im lo achshav ematai. We'll see you next Monday, Be'ezrat Hashem. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai le'olam. Amen ve'amen.